All right. Well, we're very excited to be here, Mary Beth and I, to have an opportunity to talk to you about repurposing your transcription skills. Well, as we know, the healthcare environment's changing, and there are many factors that are contributing to that change. I'm sure that you're probably aware of the increasing use of the electronic health record, which is impacting the need for dictation and transcription. You've also probably heard about ICD-10 and what does that mean. We've had a couple delays, and it looks like 2015, we hope, the ICD-10 will be implemented. And as part of that, um, there's a real lack of highly skilled coders that have hospital skills and are credentialed for hospital coding. And so all of these components together are really making, this is a real time of change, and I think everybody in healthcare is feeling it in one way or another. And we see specifically transcriptionists are often um, being replaced, or a lot of their work is being taken over by voice recognition. And I know we've heard about voice recognition for quite a while now, um, but it has made an impact on how we do our work. I know transcriptionists have moved from strictly typing, now there are some opportunities to be editors, and so it's changing the way that we work. The template-driven documentation in the electronic health records, where providers go in and just click on certain templates to create documentation, has also decreased that need for dictation. And we're also seeing some outsourcing and offshoring, um, where some of that work is being sent um, to other countries to do for whatever reason, uh, because maybe they can't find transcriptionists, or maybe pricing, or whatever that reason might be. But those are all the factors that are really having an impact on healthcare at this point in time. Bill Murray said, your job as you know it is gone. And we see that over and over again. And for example, uh, in my previous role as an HIM director, we saw roles within our department change. We used to have file clerks, and now those file clerks are scanning clerks. And so their job has totally changed. And transcriptionists, I think, are in a unique position because as your jobs are changing, I think it opens some great opportunities. Um, you, ex you have explicit knowledge and you have implicit knowledge. The explicit knowledge is what you gained when you had your formal training for transcription. It's really the base of that foundational knowledge that you have in order to be a transcriptionist. And then you also gained additional knowledge, which we call implicit knowledge. This is what you learned on the job, you know, the specifics about how to create a report, how to do an edit, and those kinds of things. And that's your implicit knowledge. So these are the things that you possess. These are the things that you've been taught, your medical terminology, which is a language, that's a specific language. And those of us who've been exposed to medical terminology for a long time, we just take it as something that we know. But that really is a, learning a whole new language. Our understanding and knowledge of anatomy and physiology, which as we talk about ICD-10 becomes more and more important. But that's a key knowledge that you have in order to create those legal documents as part of the transcriptionist role, you really have to understand that to be able to decipher what the dictator is saying to you. You also have a wonderful understanding of pathophysiology, disease process, as well as pharmacology. You have a good grasp of drugs and when those drugs are used. So all of this composes really your foundational knowledge um, that you possess as a transcriptionist. You also have, as we talked about earlier, the implicit knowledge. You understand how healthcare works. And again, if you're outside of healthcare, it's almost like a maze. But when you work in it, you understand the process. You know the kinds of services that are provided. You understand what an emergency department visit is as opposed to a surgical daycare visit, as opposed to an outpatient or an inpatient. You're familiar with medical records and medical record keeping and the language of medicine. You can interpret what's being said. I heard a great comment um, someone said to me way back a long time ago in the beginning of my career, and they said, we speak the language, but we do not practice the art. And I think that's true of, of us in coding as well as transcription. You also have a really good understanding of the sequencing of those events. So for example, you understand when a patient presents to a hospital, for example, they're usually seen in the emergency department or they could be seen in an outpatient department. Something happens, 
They then go through the admission process, and you know that there will be a history and physical, which is that initial assessment. There will be some progress notes, maybe a procedure note, and then a discharge summary, which is that the summary of the events and the care that was provided to that patient. So you have a, this is a tremendous knowledge base that you may or may not recognize that you really, you have. And that has value. And as a skilled transcriptionist, there are several um, uh, behaviors that are important that also transition well to coding. You're able to work well independently. As a transcriptionist, you're plugged in, you're listening to dictation, you're creating these reports. And as a coder, you're oftentimes sitting at a desk, reading a record, either electronic or if it's hybrid, you've got some paper, and you're focused. You have high attention to detail. We also know in both of these roles how important accuracy is. We need to make sure that those medical reports are accurate, that we've got the right drugs, we've got all of the right words, and you know that little nuances can make a whole amount of, of difference in that report. Just as a coder needs to be sure that they've captured all of the documentation in their classification system so that that claim truly reflects the care that was provided to that patient and that the organization that they're working for is paid appropriately. And then the ability to follow through. As a transcriptionist, if you, if you can't quite understand a word, you know in your organization what steps to follow. Do you leave a blank? Do you send it to QA? Are there other options that you need to do? And the same with coding. If you run into something you're not sure of or there isn't enough documentation to get the most accurate code, do you let that code go with a nonspecific code or do you query? And again, you understand what those job responsibilities are and you know the steps to be able to follow through to make sure that that claim is coded correctly or to make sure that report is transcribed appropriately. Andy Warhol said, they always say time changes things, but actually you have to change them yourself. And I think that is true for most of us. I think we have to take a positive approach and say, yes, we understand healthcare is changing, but what opportunities are presenting to me that I can move forward? So we're here today to talk about some wonderful career options that both Mary Beth and I uh, feel that I know that for my career, um, I've always loved coding. It's served me well as a career, and there's so many opportunities. Um, as a coder, you can work in an uh, institution and code claims, you, but there's other options. You can work in patient accounts, which is a wonderful area to work on to be able, could you bring that coding knowledge, you understand the reimbursement, you understand the classification system. And medical billing, whether it's in a physician's office or in a facility, uh, again, you bring that expertise to that, that role. Then there are op opportunities in alternative healthcare settings, and I know with some of our new students, we've talked about ways in which they can uh, get that first position. And it can be in one of these alternative settings where you can get your foot in the door and again begin to use your skills, so it's a great way to start your career. So some of those um, healthcare settings include home health, long-term care, could be behavioral health. There's lots of different opportunities um, for you to start your career in coding. So we need to do a, a quick reality check. You know, I, I think that coding is exciting, and a lot of folks read uh, information about you know being a coder. You can learn to code in six weeks, and you can make all of this money. Well, I just want to give a couple cautions that it's true that coding is a wonderful prof profession. It's true that there are some opportunities for for um, for good salaries, um, but be wary uh, because. Um, coding is uh, a demanding profession, as is transcription. You didn't learn to transcribe in six weeks, um, and coding will take some more time, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want everyone to kind of stop and think, what's the career path that will offer challenges, um, opportunities, but there will also be challenges along the way. So you need to be realistic about, this is what I need to learn. This is the time, the realistic time frame. These are the demands that are going to be placed on me, and, and am I ready for that? change is hard. And as, as prepared as you think you may be, things always happen and there is uncertainty. So as you think about a new profession, and I hope that you do, if, if transcription is for you a challenge at this point in time, and I know there are some transcriptionists that are, are struggling, um, I really think that coding is a great opportunity, but I want you to think about it realistically. Really the first step is that self-assessment. Um, 
you know, one of the questions is, am I too old to learn a new profession? And I have to tell you personally, I was an HIM director for 30 years, and um, in the end of my career, I worked with Mary Beth and in a coding course, and I achieved my CCS credential um, at, in my late 50s. So I truly feel that we are always open for new opportunities, and um, but you know that's that's your own perception and that's your own feeling. But that's a question you need to ask yourself. Um, what are the skill set? As we talked about earlier, transcriptionists have a wealth of skills that bring to this this particular profession. What kind of work do I want to do? You know from transcription, it can be isolating. You are working on a computer. You are stuck in a seat most of the day. Um, those of us that enjoy it, uh, it's a great career for us. Um, so think about that. And then lastly, do I actually have the time and the resources to invest in training? So we know that it's going to take some time. We know that there'll be a financial investment. And so when you look at your, you plot your course, how long is it going to take me to learn this new skill? How much is it going to cost me? And will it fit into my life at this point in time? So those are all the kind of self-assessment questions that you need to kind of go through in your mind so that you feel comfortable. Because if you're going to invest your time and your money, you want to get the best bang for your buck. So as you, you do your self-assessment and you get excited and you say, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for me, there's some other, other uh, pieces of information that are helpful to you. First of all, if you work for an employer, they may offer some tuition reimbursement, especially if they're a healthcare employer. They may provide um, uh, resources for you to pay for either some or all of your training. In addition, if you work for a, a provider, there may be opportunities for that first level of, of a position uh, in coding. And it may not be a coding position. It may be, as we talked earlier, in patient accounts, or it may be an alternative setting. Uh, but there's some opportunities to kind of get an idea of, uh, will there be a position for me when I finish my training? And then when do I need to be ready? Are there things, uh, you know, you have a, we all have busy lives, but you have to think about the scope of time it's going to take me to train and when's the best time for me to do that. So when you look at your training options, some other things you need to think about, oftentimes uh, employers will provide training, such as on-the-job training. And um, in my previous experience, this is how we trained coders years ago, is that we brought folks on that had an aptitude or an interest, we pair them with a seasoned coder, and they would learn on the job. In this day and age, with all of the healthcare changes and things getting, we need to get those claims out quickly, we need to make sure they're highly accurate, it's very difficult now to provide on the job training. And so a lot of employers are looking outside for those training options. There are community colleges that offer either coding certificate programs or uh, here in Maine, we have a couple community colleges that offer an associate's degree uh, in medical coding and electronic health records, for example. And so you need to look at what, how do I learn, what's the best uh, learning methodology for me, what's my time frame, how much time can I invest in my training. And then there are specialized training providers. There are professional associations like uh, the American Health Information Management Association or the American Academy of Professional Coders, which is two of the professional associations that provide um, coding training. And then there are workforce training companies uh, as well that provide training for coders. So you have a broad range, and you know, the internet and Google can be your best friend in terms of looking for uh, what training program will, will fit for me. You also have to think about your geographic location. Uh, if you're interested in a community college, is there one, is there a program that's nearby? You may need to look at a more online training program if you're in particular areas where it's not feasible to drive to a site. So is online learning the right answer for me? Do I need instructor-led? Those are the kinds of things, as we talked about, the delivery. Um, and, and you need to make that decision based on how you feel you can work with that education partner. And that will help you make that decision on your learning plan. So why, why become a coder? Well, as I said earlier, there is a huge demand for skilled and capable coders. And we see there's really two types of coders that we see in healthcare. There's a, a discipline of coding that focuses on what we call the professional side. These are coders that are usually trained 
in the AAPC curriculum, American Cody, uh, Academy of Professional Coders, and their focus is really on the outpatient side. They will code uh, professional services that physicians provide. They may code some ambulatory services, and the work is usually located in a physician's office or an ambulatory care site. The other side are the hospital coders or facility coders. This is a, a little bit different training. The certification is different. It's from the American Health Information Management Association, or HEMA. Uh, they have a couple levels of credential, uh, an entry level credential, and then a mastery level credential. Um, and I really see this as just Pam Haney's opinion, but I really see in my experience this is where the, the, the big deficit for coders, is, coders will be is on the hospital side. The training is more intense. It's more um, disciplined, um, but uh, this is where I believe the, the careers will be as well as the salaries uh, will be better. And again, that's just Pam Haney's opinion. Um, being a coder can also offer flexible work. You can choose your location, the type of coding, and the hours. Again, depending on the location, the type of work that you want to do, uh, just like transcription, uh, coders are now beginning to move remote. Um, I think that most coders will need to get some experience under their belt, just like in transcription. You didn't learn to transcribe and then work remotely all of a sudden until you had that skill set and the ability to work independently and productively. Um, so it takes a little while for coders, but um, that's the trend that we're seeing now with the implementation of the electronic health records. Uh, the salaries are very good, and I think they're increasing. And there's a great career path. Um, and once you learn to code, there are all kinds of opportunities down the road, again, to, to use that coding skill and move into other roles. And you can see here at the bottom of the slide, this is a HEMA's um, statistic that when we implement ICD-10, that there is expected 53% um, nationwide shortage in hospital coders. And so that is a huge opportunity, I believe, for folks that have any interest in coding because that's where the jobs will be. And if, we are, if we're not able to fill those jobs, you can bet the salaries will go up and the opportunities will be there. So I want to become a coder, what does it take? And you'll look at these uh, strong skills and knowledge and you'll see these we talked about earlier. This is the foundational knowledge that transcriptionists have. Medical terminology, anatomy and physiology, disease process, and pharmacology. In a training program, there are really some five components to a training program, and this should be, this is sort of what you should look at as uh, ground rules when you're looking for a program. It's important to understand the health information management practices and principles that include confidentiality, HIPAA, I'm sure you're probably familiar with those. What, what uh, constitutes a complete record? What documentation is required so that we can code correctly? You need to understand the purpose and function of a legal medical record. And when is the record complete? When is it available and ready for us to code? And there's no more information that would be added that might change the way that we code that chart. You need to have a thorough understanding of the classification systems. Right now, we're training in ICD-9. Until next year, then we'll, we'll switch to ICD-10. But you need to understand the diagnostic coding as well as the procedure coding. Other classification systems, the CPT, which is the current procedural terminology that's used for physician services, as I talked about earlier on the professional side and outpatient. The DSM is used in behavioral health. That's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Then there's also a classification specific to cancer registry, and that's the International Classification of Diseases for Oncology. And then the fifth component is really understanding hands-on coding. Any training program that you look at should have some kind of what we call professional practice experience where you're presented with uh, a simulation of medical records. As a coder, you read through that record, you determine which codes should be coded, how they're coded, the sequencing, so that you really begin to get that practical experience. And I just want to take a couple minutes and share a case study that we did in Maine. Um, and we were very successful in repurposing our transcriptionist. Um, for the past two years, before I came to Libman, I was the director of coding services at Cinternet. And Cinternet is a component of Maine Health, which is the largest, one of the largest healthcare employers in Maine. And we provided services that included medical transcription 
and um, coding. And so we noticed um, as part of our training, uh, as we were trying to recruit coders, that our need for dictation and transcription was decreasing. And we had transcriptionists that we were not able to keep busy. And at the same time, we had a demand for credentialed hospital coders. We couldn't meet that demand. So that's when we identified, you know what, our transcriptionists have this knowledge base. Let's train our transcriptionists and repurpose them and move them into a coding role. So we looked at our current transcriptionists. We, we um, decided to limit our class to 12 participants. And again, because they had that foundational knowledge of medical terminology, pathophysiology, anatomy and physiology, we knew that it would make a great transition. So for us at CenterNet, what we did is we developed a specific policy. We decided to develop tuition reimbursement for all of our transcriptionists that were willing to step up and go through this training program. We also decided to pay for their training time. We had uh, a class time where the transcriptionists participated and worked with Mary Beth, and that was paid time any time they needed to do homework or outside work that was on their own time. But we felt strongly we wanted to support these folks to get into a coding role. We also required them to not only finish their training, but to sit for their entry-level certification, their CCA, or Certified Coding Associate certification through AHIMA. And once they achieved that, we also provided uh, reimbursement for that certification. And then the last piece was, once you achieve your certification, just like in your transcription role, if you're a certified transcriptionist, you need to maintain those skills with ongoing education and demonstrate that you're getting continuing education units. So we also provided that to our staff. So once we chose our staff, we notified them, and we, we um, selected our cohort of students. And we, as I said, we started with 12 students. And so we partnered with um, Living Education. And I'll let Mary Beth talk about the specifics of the training program. <clears throat> Mary Beth, are you there? I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. As um, Pam had told you, we, um, CenterNet had partnered up with Libman Education and to develop a specific program to meet their specific needs for the employees that they wanted to train. Um, so anytime that you're looking for a program, if you're in an organization that is going to try to do the same type of thing, you want to customize the training. You want to make sure that the training meets the needs of the students. Um, Pam select, um, carefully selected the participants, and as she said, we had 12 of them. It was important for us to keep the class size small, simply because it it ensured that there was a lot of individual time between the teacher and the student. If the students in a lot, very large class, they tend to get lost. The, um, our training sessions were developed for 26 weeks. The, the program consisted of very focused material, um, and the time that we spent on each of the material was very limited. And our goal at the end of the 26 weeks was to prepare each of the students to sit for the AHIMA CCA certification. Everything we did was to provide them with the basic knowledge that they needed to succeed in the coding profession and knowledge so that they were able to pass the CCA certification exam. If you're looking at a program like this, or the way we looked at it is that there was a lot of discussion up front about the realistic expectations from both the employer and the new coder student that was participating in the program. Pam? The training material that we selected, Pam and I had looked at numerous different material, but we had selected the Faye Brown book. It seemed the most um, comprehensive provided the students with um, a very basic knowledge and explained it in layman's term. It was a handbook that they could keep 
and use going forward once they got into a position. It would be a resource material that they could always go back to. We also use the AHIMA Clinical Workout Book, and we use additional um, cases and exercises that are proprietary to um, limited education. So with these three materials, what we had done with the Faye Brown, we provided the basic knowledge that they needed, a strong foundation, took that basic knowledge and applied it to the AHIMA Clinical Workout, which is your basic or intermediate examples. And then we used, advanced them into specific cases and exercises to help prepare them for um, their first role in the coding profession. The curriculum consisted of teaching the ICD-9 rather than the ICD-10 because it was a ways off. Um, they were taught coding using a book, not an encoder. Very, we feel very, very strongly that that's the way that everyone should be taught how to code, not through a computer system. We focused a lot on the coding guidelines, which I call the ABCs of coding. And we used the AHIMA Clinical Workout Book um, to start applying those concepts to some actual medical scenarios. Students were also taught the basic CPT, Current Procedural Terminology. This is the code system that's used for the outpatient setting and also for physician office billing and coding. They were taught the system itself. They were taught how to read an op report. You know how to type up an op report. Now you would be taught how to read an op report. Our focus was to give them an, a lot of experience with in the outpatient setting, because that's typically the first um, area that a um, new coder is going to walk into. Their first position is more outpatient than inpatient. The other thing that we covered in the curriculum was some test-taking strategies. As we spoke, the goal was to um, sit for and successfully pass the CCA exam. So I worked a lot with the students on specific test-taking strategies so that they were able to take this knowledge and now apply it to a, an exam, a standardized test. Yeah. The training, um, as I stated, was 26 weeks long. Um, during that 26 weeks, we would meet for two hours um, in what we call a virtual classroom. It was through GoToMeeting, very similar to what we have right here with um, GoToWebinar. So instead of meeting together in one physical place, because these students were all located in different parts of the country, and some of them in very um, rural areas, they were able to achieve the education by meeting online for two hours each week. During that two hours, we had lecture. We had interactive coding exercises. And it was an opportunity for the students to ask and get answers to questions directly to the instructor. There was also homework assignments. Um, it was roughly. Um, four to six additional hours of homework on top of the two hours that we met together on a weekly basis. Um, and that was what was expected out of them. We, we had 12 students that started in the program after the first two or three weeks. We had two students that dropped out of the program, which seems normal and expected. You, you don't really know what it is until you try it. And two people had pretty much decided that it really wasn't what they wanted to do. So they dropped out of the program. So that left us with 10 students that completed the 26-week program. Out of those 10, six have currently sat for and passed the CCA exam. And we have four out of the 10 that are scheduled to sit for the exam soon. So we've um, we have succeeded in training these um, transcriptionists. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. And I think another component when you're looking at a training program that is 
that is really critical is the internship component. And at Cinternet, we decided to budget 10 hours per week over 26 weeks for each of our transcriptionists, the 10 transcriptionists that completed the program. And what we were going to do is partner them with one of our certified coders, and they would just start with 100% review the first week and then provide decreasing supervision as that student began to uh, increase their skills and their accuracy. We started with outpatient ancillary, which are the probably the, the easiest um, types of claims to code. Uh, very few codes and they're pretty straightforward. Then we move them on to the emergency department coding, surgical daycares, and then into observation. So that gave them that progression as Mary Beth uh, talked earlier about how we start with outpatient and then move um, uh, step by step into more complex types of cases. And at, during this time, um, the balance of their hours, if they were either full-time or part-time, they would continue to transcribe for us. So it helped us to make that transition to keep our transcriptionists employed and help move them into their new career. Um, we feel strongly about coding certification. I can tell you as an HIM director in my previous role, um, I always looked for coding certification whenever I had a position open. I wanted to, to know that that applicant was able to demonstrate a minimum competency and proficiency by exam. And once they achieved that certification, that they were committed to their ongoing um, continuing education to maintain that skill as well as that credential. The um, AHIMA certifications include the CCA, which is a Certified Coding Associate. That's entry level. And after you finish your training program, that would be your first level of, of credential. Um, CCS is what we call the mastery level, that's a certified coding specialist, and that's usually after you've had um, broad experience with all patient types, outpatient, ED, surgical daycare, observation, and inpatients. And we consider that to be a mastery level um, certification. Then AHIMA also offers a CCSP, which is similar to the CCS, but it has a focus on the physician side, as we talked about earlier on the professional side. Then the American Academy of Professional Coders um, offers many credentials. The common ones are the CPC, Certified Professional Coder, and the CPCH, which is a Certified Professional Coder for hospitals. They also offer a numerous um, specialty certifications. So for example, if you had an interest in interventional radiology, there's a certification for that under AAPC. If you're interested in ED specific coding, they have a certification for that, et cetera. So I would strongly recommend that you research these two organizations um, at thehema.org and aapc.com. Um, they are the two most respected coding credentials in healthcare, and um, they have a, a wealth of information on both of their websites. So that's a great place to go if you have any um, interest in, in the coding and the coding profession. There are some other companies that offer coding credentials. I'm not familiar with all of them. Um, I can only speak to my experience that these are the two primary ones that you know, I know as, as an HIM director that I would look for these, these types of certifications. Um, and when you are looking, you want to make sure that the quality of the training and it's what a, a, your potential employer will accept for certification. So it's helpful to go onto these websites and just look at the jobs that are posted and look at what they're looking for in terms of certification. And you'll see many, most of them will ask for CCS, CCSP, CPC, or CPCH. Those are the most common. So once you achieve your coding certification, again, we talked about that career path. There are wonderful opportunities um, in auditing, and auditing is where we look at the documentation, we look at the claim, we look at what was coded, and we make sure that everything is appropriate. And it's a nice feedback loop. The same with clinical documentation improvement, which is becoming more and more important because this is really a process by which we look at documentation uh, pretty close to the point of service. It can be concurrently, it can be close right after discharge. Again, we're looking to make sure that the documentation is appropriate so that the coders can code as accurately as possible. And again, that's a feedback loop. So feedback goes back to the providers and it also goes back to the coders. There are opportunities throughout the revenue cycle. Revenue cycle starts in admission 
and it goes right through that claims adjudication. So there are all kinds of departments along the way, such as health information management, patient access, financial services, denial management. Denial management is where if a claim is submitted and it's not paid to an organization or to a physician's office, it's important that someone takes a look at that claim to see was documentation inappropriate? Did we use a wrong code? Were there's a wrong combination codes? Were there medical necessity issues? Very complex, and that's a whole nother um, area of expertise that coders can bring with additional training and be very successful in these roles. So I want to leave you just with a thought that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And we hope that we've lit a fire in you. So here is our contact information. Both Mary Beth and I are happy to, to answer any questions that anyone may have, uh, either now or please feel free to contact us at any time, and we're happy to, uh, to answer what, any questions you may have. So Candy, I'll hand it back to you. OK, I just had to unmute myself. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I, you can either kind of raise your hand and I will unmute you, or um, you can type a question into the uh, question box. Or the um, chat window, no? Goodness. See, you did such a great job, Pam. <laughs> yeah, it really so did. Very good presentation, uh, very in-depth and thought-provoking, and it's nice to know that there are things out there that uh, transcriptionists can use. They're very valuable skills. You know, exactly. it, we can shift into different occupations. Um, just because some of the transcription is drying up, it doesn't mean that we um, have to kind of sit on our hands and, and be at a loss. I just wanted to add one thing, Candy, as the instructor. Um, the 12 students that I started with, they were very um, enthusiastic. They showed up every week with all of their assignments done. They showed up ready to learn. And they were a, I, I've taught in a lot of different settings, and they were a pleasure to deal with. It, it, as adult learners, they were enthusiastic. They were like sponges. Give me more. Give me more homework, <laughs> Mary Beth. <laughs> now, um, we do have a couple of questions that have popped up in the box. Um, are the coders now all employed that went through it? Right. Um, I, I, and I'm, I, Mary Beth and I have lost, since I've left Internet, and I know Mary Beth has been in touch with some of, some of them, the interesting thing is the challenge we see is getting coders from training into the workforce. And several of them have taken alternative positions. I know there's someone who works in home health, someone works in long-term care. So they're using their skill set, but they've got their foot in the door in a coding role. Uh, Mary Beth, have you heard from others that have been successful? Those are the ones that I've heard from. Um, right. You know, at this point, I kind of have to rely on whether or not they contact me and give me that information. Right. And I think, Candy, part of the issue was there was a big push last year when I was with Cinternet because everybody was trying to do dual coding in preparation for ICD-10 this October. And so people were scrambling for coders. And that's where we were sort of like, oh my goodness, we've got to get our, our workforce trained and ready to go. Then when we had the delay happen early this year, I think everybody has sort of taken a step back and they're reassessing. And we're, I think people are a little gun shy. Is it really going to happen in 2015? But I think as time goes on, I think probably this is the time to train because early next year, I think people are going to realize, oh my goodness, it is going to happen this year. We've got to ramp up our dual coding and we're going to start seeing that impact on productivity and everybody's going to be looking for hospital coders, and, and they're not out there. Yeah, and, and I have read in various sources that the need for coders is actually going to double. 
Yes. And especially there are a lot of coders now that are at the end of their careers or <laughs> toward the end. Of, it's like with transcription. Um, right. There are a lot of them that are getting ready to retire. A lot of them that are getting ready to retire are not terribly interested in moving on mm -hmm. to ICD-10. And we hear that quite often uh, with seasoned coders. They have such a breadth of knowledge, but they say, you know what? I know these codes in my head, and it's going to be too hard for me to learn. I'm going to retire. We hear that over and over again. Although I have to say, I've taught um, I-10 one semester and what I've, at the community college, and what I found is that most coders who, who learn, and Mary Beth, you might have a different experience, but most coders, seasoned coders who try ICD-10, they make a very easy transition. And they, they find that, you know what, it's not as bad as I thought. Um, so it, it, the PCS, the procedure coding, is a little more challenging, but I think that coders that initially were sort of, you know what, I'm not going to learn I-10, once they start it and they, they see it's, it's a great system, it's a great classification system, it's different than what they do now. Well, from what I understand, it's going to be more, there are going to be more codes, correct? There so are that, tremendous that they more are, codes. And mm -hmm. they are much more specific. Exactly. And for an example, with um, in, in ICD-9, there are many non-specific codes. In I-10, we need to know laterality. Is it on the left side of the body or the right side of the body, impaired organs? Uh, we need to know much greater specificity, especially on the procedure side. Right now, we code the name of the procedure, like a Whipple procedure. We code a Whipple procedure. In ICD-10, we need to know the mechanics of that procedure because we have root operations on ICD-10. So no longer can we code from an acronym, we have to know exactly what, that's why your A&P, your med term, your disease process, be able to read, as Mary Beth talked about, be able to read that op report and understand what's being done, where it's being done, and why it's being done. That is key for, for coders. Right. Um, another question, do you think that the need for medical transcriptionists will be eliminated permanently at some point? <sighs> Well, you know, we heard that, I want to say, 15 years ago, we were hearing that with voice recognition. Oh, yes. my goodness, you know, Dragon <laughs> Dictate is going to replace all these, co these transcriptionists. And that hasn't happened. Um, you know, I, I saw firsthand some of the challenges with voice recognition when you don't have a transcriptionist review it and edit it. Um, and the horrible documentation. And ICD-10 is so much more specific that you do need that level of specificity. So. I honestly don't see transcription going away. Uh, I certainly, I think it will continue to decline um, just because I think that as the EHR systems are rolled out, um, you know, again, with the template-driven documentation, um, I, I do think it will begin to decline, uh, continue to decline. But I don't think it will go away um, at this point. I know that several um, single office providers or small practices will probably still continue to dictate um, so I, I don't see it going away, but um, you know I don't know if, if it will be viable for you know for someone new coming into a, the profession. I'm not sure long-term viability as opposed to coding, where I see you know just tremendous growth. Right. Um, now a, a few there are three more questions that have popped up. Uh, Great. Which do you think would be um, more beneficial, training in ICD-10 or 9? And my um, additional little spin on this one is, would it be necessary to learn ICD-9 before transitioning into 10? Mary Beth, what do you think? I'll let her take this question. Um, it wouldn't be necessary if you would not have to be trained in 9-9 to learn to I-10. Um, there are, they say, Back to what we were discussing before, you know, where coders were resigning or retiring because they weren't going to learn I-10. I'll be honest with you, I was one of those people. Um, <laughs> and it's just because we're all kind of cut from the same cloth. We don't like change. <laughs> ICD-10 is a different classification system. It's different, and we just don't like different. However, I've seen a lot of people, when we speak at the um, procedural part of it, that had no experience with it whatsoever, actually have an easier time learning it than those that have I-9 training or experienced I-9 coding. So you don't need to have the I-9 
um, if you chose to just have the I-10. And then the question is, which way should you go? Should you be trained in I-9 or I-10? Um, the stage of the game right now, it depends upon when you're going to start your training, how long your training is going to be. If it, if you're not going to start it till like January and it's going to extend into September, I would suggest at that point to learn I-10 because then you would be able, you would be trained for the system that will be used October 1st of 2015. However, if you were going to start your training now or sometime in September, I would say go ahead and learn the I-9. Um, the transition from I-9 to I-10 is going to be very easy for you. The same concepts still apply, it's still the same ABCs. You know, there's a few more rules, but how you look something up in the book, the basic coding steps, that all stays the same. It's the actual codes that will be different. And I, I agree with that. And also, we actually ran into this problem with our uh, class last fall because we started teaching I-10 last fall at our community college. And so our students were in their second semester of I-10 in the spring when the delay happened. And so what we did at the community college is we offered additional training in I-9 to our students. Um, and those students did very well. So I think the same would apply. Uh, and I agree with Mary Beth, I think the, time, the timing will make that decision. Um, so if you do take I-9 in the fall and we do go live in October, I think there will be um, ample opportunities um, to learn I-10. And regardless of which classification, classification system that you learn, I think the transition to either one or the other will be pretty straightforward. The, the numbers are a little bit different. Um, the rules are very similar. There might be a couple other little guidelines that may be a little bit different, but the concepts are the same. So I think you'll be successful no matter which way you go. Okay, and another question, and I think this is, the, the next two questions I believe are burning questions, um, especially with the pay rates now, and you and I discussed this yesterday, uh, the pay rates uh, of medical transcriptionists, and even the extremely um, seasoned transcriptionists are having difficulties even making minimum wage, you know, because of the, um, because of the, the line rates that everyone is, is offering and right. the fact that most are ICs as opposed to actual employees. Mm -hmm. So um, this question I think is very important. Um, what is the pay like? Is it a lot more than transcription? Um, is it more an employee? basis or is it um, an independent contractor basis, that kind of thing? Well, I, what I would recommend is um, the two websites that I talked about, AHIMA and AAPC, both of those organizations do an annual salary survey and the salary varies by several things. It varies by geographic location, and remember because you work, many coders work remote, so it's really where the base, so I live in Maine, but if I worked for a company in Boston, the salary would be different than if I worked for a company in Maine. So it's based on geographic location, it's based on years of experience, and it's based on level of certification and training. So uh, you know, it's really hard to say, oh, it's this range or that range, but if you go to those two websites, remember the AAPC is outpatient physician based, those salaries may be a little lower, um, but if you go to AHIMA, and you look for um, salary survey, those salaries are usually a little bit higher. Uh, because of the depth and breadth of the certification requirements is more than AAPC. I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just a different kind of training and it's a different set of skills and a different set of expectations. Um, but I can tell you that um, there is a wonderful career path in coding. Um, as I, we said earlier, there are different, um, you can be an auditor, you can work in clinical documentation improvement, you can work in denials management, and all of those tracks will increase your salary. So the wonderful thing about coding is I think that, you know, when you're starting now, um, your salary now, you will only see it increase as you, as you build your proficiency, you build your repertoire of being able to code different types of cases. Interventional radiology is a wonderful specialty. It's rare and it's a great way, you know, to have sort of a niche. Um, and there are other kinds of specialties that you can get into. Um, so 
I just think that the, the earning potential as a coder is wonderful. Um, and and Mary Beth, I don't know if you have thoughts, but um, I just feel, if, again, if you go to those websites, you'll get a really good sense of salary ranges by years of experience, credential, and um, geographic location. No, I, I think you said it very well, Pam. You know, it really depends upon a lot of things. You know, just to remind people that you're really starting out at entry level and, um, you know, it, if you go to a hospital doing ancillary coding, you're not going to make as much money as a seasoned inpatient coder. It's really kind of starting out at the bottom, but I think the advances and the potential for salary increases is great. Okay, now the other burning financial question, and uh, we did discuss this yesterday, um, what roughly um, does tra is the training going to cost? Mm -hmm. Well, and again, it depends on the type of training that you're looking at. Uh, we actually, um, at Libman, we're putting together our medical coder training program, um, and we're taking the, the sort of the, the program, the project that we did with Mary Beth and building a coding training program from that. So as we were putting that together, we did research and we looked out um, at organizations that were providing training. And um, there's training through both AAPC and AHIMA, um, sort of self-directed training. Uh, those are around $2,500 for the program, depending on the level of certification. Um, our program is around $3,000, $3,200. Um, and then there are programs at community colleges, uh, the certificate programs that you know, can be three, four, five thousand. And then there are two-year programs. We found some that were ten to twelve thousand. So it is a full range. But what you have to think about is the delivery method. What works for you geographically? What's close to you? Do you want to have an instructor-led? Do you want to be self-directed? Um, also, what's included in your training? Sometimes it's just the training materials. Sometimes it includes your book. Sometimes it includes prep, uh, you know, certification prep classes. So you really need to do your homework and look at, as we said earlier, what's the best fit for you um, in terms of your training. So it, there's a broad range uh, of of costs, and of course, I think those costs also sort of reflect um, whether it's you know a school with a degree versus you know a training company that's going to get you the skills to sit and be able to work. Right. And the um, last question that I see here is, how do coders get evaluated or audited? Um, there, there's a couple kind of standard ways um, that we, we evaluate our coding. Um, most organizations have some expectations. So I can just speak from my experience. Um, we had, what, every, every year we did a coding plan in my last organization, and so there were five components. We actually had three levels of coders, coder one, coder two, coder three. This is just, again, this is my example. Coder one were entry level. They, we looked at their training, their certification, their experience, their productivity, and their quality. Those are the five components that we looked at in each of those levels. So depending on the level of certification, how quickly you could code, how accurate you could code, the level of certification, um, that puts you in, in what level, and the salary increase with each of those levels. And you know, our goal was to bring folks in at level one and work with them and continue to provide that training and education up to level three. So, you know, and I think coding is a little bit different than transcription. Most coders are employed, either employed by an organization or employed by a company, you know, like Barry Lemonade employs coders, um, and so that you're an employee. Um, and normally you'll have productivity expectations based on the types of claims that you're coding, uh, medical records that you're coding. You'll also have accuracy expectations. And I know transcriptionists are used to working under productivity and accuracy, um, you know, anywhere from 95 to 98% accuracy. And, and, you know, depending on how many charts per day or per hour, um, each organization is a little bit different. The number of inpatient charts, for example, that you're expected to code at a small community hospital will differ greatly from if you're coding charts in a trauma center, for example, because they're much more complex. Um, so I think that's pretty standard. Mary Beth, do you see other types of models for monitoring employees? Um, no, I think that pretty much sums it up. Really, the employer really takes a look at the quality and the productivity of each of the different 
entities or levels of coding within the organization. You know, sometimes they do it internally, sometimes it's done externally. That would be the only other thing I'd add. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, we've just gone, we've squeaked past our uh, one hour, which I kind of expected, actually. And um, if there are no further questions, we can wrap this up and let all of you um, get back to your day. I want to thank you, um, Mary Beth and Pam, for the presentation. It was extremely informative. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees. Um, you will receive uh, a, rec a link to the recording, <clears throat> excuse me, of the session. Um, that will be going out hopefully within the next couple of days. And um, again, you will get a copy of um, the slides and um, they will be converted into a PDF format. So, um, you know, you can um, refer back to the slide at your leisure and if you need to get a hold of Mary Beth or Pam you can. Um, I'm hoping that they will be at Adenema this year um, at our meeting in November in Springfield. Hopefully uh, the company will get a, a booth, I'm hoping anyway, and it would be really nice to meet Pam and Mary Beth, both in person if possible. Um, but in the meantime, if you do have questions, you can contact them. And um, that's it. I think we'll uh, wrap this up now. And um, you'll be getting, like I say, you'll be getting a copy of the recording within a few days. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.